Welcome back to The Debrief. It's been a few months since we've been here to talk about competition climbing, but thank goodness uh, the, the gods have given us more great climbing on plastic and wood. Uh, my name's Tyler Norton, as always, joined by John Bergman, uh, writer for uh, for every climbing publication in the United States, and of course, the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing, which you can buy now on Amazon, and I imagine there's also an audiobook, so make sure you get that for Christmas for the climber that you love. And joining us this week to talk about the European Championships is, of course, the editor-in-chief of UK Climbing from her fresh new digs in Scotland, Natalie Berry. Natalie, thank you for joining us. How are you doing? Great. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, I'm doing good. Um, hoping the Wi-Fi doesn't pack in. This is the first day I've tested it. So, yeah. I, I hope so, too. <laughs> If it doesn't work out, John and I are just going to keep going and just pretend nothing ever happened. There'll just be a frozen image of you in the center for the entire episode, and we'll just have to live with that. John, it's been months since we uh, since we last did one of these. Uh, what's been going on in uh, in your neck of the woods, man? Uh, not a whole lot with the uh, ongoing pandemic. I don't I don't mean to make light of it. Uh, serious serious issue, but how dare uh, you? I've just been. Uh, kind of cooped up, uh, but I'm excited to see both of you. This is kind of like a joining of the. I don't know the the forces with Natalie, you know, the in isolation force and the Plastic yeah. Weekly force. It's the YouTube podcast vlog uh, world of comp climbing coming together. So it's cool. Yeah. It's when great you... to finally meet you guys because I feel like we've interacted a lot but never actually done an episode together. So when you guys um... when you guys started in isolation, I was like, okay, we've got competitors now. I need <laughs> I need Eddie Falk on this podcast every week. I need like. <laughs> I need all the best climbers. We got to put these guys in the dirt. I was like, I got so competitive about it, but it was actually really nice to, to uh, especially people like um, uh, like Charlie and Mike, who you hear talk a lot, but you know, an IFSC commentating job is fairly different in terms of what you can talk about and what you have time for. So that was, it was really cool. And hopefully uh, we'll get to hear more from those guys. But anyway, we're talking about the European championships that uh, just com concluded, I guess, uh, two days ago in Moscow, Russia. Uh, and we're going to do something a little different. We're just going to change up how we run the show. And we're going to start with a question. Uh, you both literally wrote articles about this. Um, and so the question is, if, if what is the headline from this event? And Natalie, I want to start with you. What's your what's the big headline coming out of Moscow? Well, this question made me laugh because usually when we write headlines, if we put results or any giveaways in the headlines, we get people complaining that we've, you know, spoiler <laughs> alert, we've ruined the results. You know, people like to catch up on it later but um so my headline was very boring like ifsc moscow european championships report but <laughs> if i had to write a really clickbaity one i think it would just be total domination by russian team in mm. the ifsc european championships because i think especially on home turf just seeing how well they did they won 12 out of 24 available medals and they clinched the two available Olympic spots um, at the very last opportunity. And then, of course, Victoria Meshkova winning, you know, triple champion, triple European champion in lead, Boulder and combined. They just couldn't have done much better, really. How, Natalie, how much do you think that that the home home court advantage whatever you want to call it played a part because i was thinking about it this is it's interesting that we've had two continental championships now uh the pan ams and then and then here in europe and at the pan ams it was in the united states and a united states competitor colin duffy qualified uh, of course alana yip qualified she's not from the united states but still hometown you know, advantage one, ain't shit alana yip well, well, taking this but thing. there was still there was still one um one American that qualified, and there were certainly plenty of other really strong um, non-Americans non competing there, but the American got the spot. And then here at Russia, the, the two Russians get the, get the spot. Um, so I'm curious to ask you, Natalie, how much you think that home, home crowd or whatever plays a part in these, in these Olympic berths, these victories? I think it does play a role. As much as you can say, oh, it'll add loads of pressure and – They'll crumble because all the family are there, their friends are there. Well, probably not in this case because of COVID. But I think just being on home turf, um, being surrounded by people who speak your language, by people you know, by being able to 
get the kinds of foods that you eat it seems really trivial but for athletes it's really important like I know a lot of athletes in Moscow actually brought their own foods to try and avoid going to the supermarket and stuff um so just feeling comfortable you know not having to travel um for as long as some other competitors I mean Russia's a big place so not all of them would have just been living rolling out of their bed in Moscow every morning but um yeah I think just the familiarity um, and just knowing that you've got lots of support quite close by will make a really big difference. Um, although I think it does depend because some athletes might be more susceptible to feeling the pressure. They might feel more expectation. Um, but clearly in Russia, it worked out for them mm-hmm. last week. So. Victoria Meshkova was a bit of a revelation. Like that's that, that that was a knockout performance for somebody who coming in. Like if you just go based off of like who are the names that we know, the people we see at competitions year over year, uh, she she blew it out of the park. And I don't want to get in too much to who we thought was going to do well at this. We'll save that for later. But um, she's she you know it's it was an interesting European Championships one because we didn't have some countries coming two because there were a lot of athletes that didn't bother because. If I have an Olympic birth and there's COVID going on, why am I going to, you know, risk it? That kind of thing. So the field was was obviously um, uh, diminished to a certain extent. Um, and it becomes so interesting how when you take away kind of that top six, those 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 recurring finalists from competitions, how it really opens up the field by a lot. And I should say that just through the <laughs> through the course of the competition, unfortunately, we saw some some top tier athletes fall to the wayside as well to injuries and other things. Uh, but it is so fascinating, this list of names who I just think of as perennial semifinalists or kind of the B team of a certain country. Um, when you even just take away a couple athletes, they they really do flourish on really difficult routes. Um, I thought it was super impressive. And and this was, I think, in my opinion, her coming out party uh, for Victoria. It was just a, a knockout. I hope that it, it, you know, lets her end up at more World Cups, hopefully through the season. But um, a really interesting climber. And from, from what I read on your report, Natalie, that it sounded like she may have actually been dealing with COVID just a few weeks yeah. before this event. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, I read uh, an interview on 8a.nu with Jens Larsen. Um, yeah, apparently she had COVID just five weeks ago, um, recovered, but had to stay in isolation, I assume, for about two weeks at home. She just trained on a fingerboard, did body weight exercises. Um, and there, there were quite a few other athletes who had COVID around the similar time. Um, but obviously, as we know, some people are more affected by it than others. And... She's, it just didn't seem to affect her performance, um, which is quite remarkable. Yeah, yeah, very good for her. Uh, John, what, uh, what, what kind of headlines did you come out of this with? Yeah, so I, I did not actually frame it in the sense of like an actual headline. <laughs> Probably too wordy that's, for that's a headline, okay. as, as Natalie and I, as, <laughs> as kind of the magazine people would know. But my headline was something like this, and this is speaking in an Olympic context, uh, as, as as long as this event was, it was like 10 days or something like that, right? And as many uh, dramatic and exciting results as we got, we didn't actually learn that much definitively, uh, or it, we didn't really learn as much as we as it would have seemed at first. And this is kind of related to what Natalie said about, and you said, Tyler, about Victoria Meshkova and whatnot. Looking at the result itself on paper and watching – you come away from this thing thinking that Victoria Meshkova is like the next big thing, right? I mean, she she just comes out of relative obscurity, for lack of a better word. Um, mid-level World Cup results, you know, a, a Russian bouldering national championship. But in, on, on the international scale, you know, we nobody was really as that familiar with her outside of Russia, I don't think. And then she just slays the competition to the point where you can't help but start thinking whenever there's like multiple championships, right? You start thinking of her in the context of somebody like Adam Andra or Yanya Garnbrett, like these people that are able to kind of do these, these multiple, multiple event wins on the largest scale. That is incredible context for, for, for placing Victoria Meshkova. But then you start to really, think about it more and start to analyze it and you start to think well 
how good would she have done if there had been more competitors there from the countries that that didn't send send athletes? You know, I don't know. That's a big question mark. Uh, then you start to think of, um, let me. Well, uh, how different would it have been? Kind of like we said at the beginning, if the if the event had been maybe not in Russia, if it had been in Belgium or Italy or Spain or something like that. And then you start to think of. Well, and also, how much did the varying COVID fitness of these athletes play a part? Because, of course, as we know, they all haven't been training at the same level like they would during a normal World Cup season or European Championship season or whatever, right? They Some of them have had gyms that have been open. Some have been closed. Some have home walls. Some have just a hangboard. Some have had COVID. Some have not had COVID. They're not entering this on the normal equal playing field of fitness that they that they typically would, I don't think. And so that's another question mark, too. So that just goes back to my point that as definitive as Victoria Meshkova's victory seemed and as much as she seemed really dominant, once you start to pick apart at it, there are still a lot of question marks about kind of just how good she is. And I don't mean to take anything away from her accomplishment by saying that. Um at the, on the same point, we haven't really talked about Alexei Rubsov yet, but there are a lot of X factors going forward with him as well. Um, mainly, uh, how good is he at this point in his career? He, he got the Olympic berth, but it was – and not to take anything away from that. He's one of my favorite competitors to watch. I've always enjoyed watching him, but he barely beat Sasha Lehman. He barely beat Sergei um, Luchetsky. Uh, by just a, a thin, thin margin, and and so how good is he? How healthy is his shoulder? How how well will his shoulder hold up as he continues to climb on it? He's a veteran. He's 32 years old. These injuries, once you're over 30, these injuries, it's it's kind of like they can sometimes lag, nag a little bit, a little bit more. Um, and and also he's going to be 33 by the time of the Olympics, right around 33 years old. Um, you know that's. That's something that we should consider, too, because as we know, when these athletes, when father time comes for an athlete, it's it's swift and sudden a lot of times. And it's like they go from looking great to all of a sudden they look very old. Um, and and again, nothing taking nothing away from Alexi, but as much as he he a well deserved Olympic birth, um, there's still a lot of question marks. You're so saying, that's kind of you're just saying you're surprised he isn't dead yet. It's still a, it's <laughs> well. <laughs> Lexi, you know, and this was maybe somewhat with the shoulder injury, but I think myself and a lot of other people were thinking maybe he was kind of over that prime of his career because he hasn't been as dominant recently as he has in the past. Um, and so we were kind of thinking, well, maybe he's sort of aging out a little bit. And then he comes out and earns the Olympic berth, and it's great. I'm, I'm, ha I'm really happy for him. Um, but he's in that elite group, but, but a rare group of those competitors like Sean McCall or Jan Hoyer, Akio Noguchi, where it's like they're a little older. The postponement certainly doesn't help them in that sense, um, you know, because they're going to be a year, even a year older than they would have been had the Olympics happened originally as planned. Um, so well, anyway, to sum up, yeah, a lot of question marks remain for as definitive as, as these results seemed. Yeah, on Alexi, like in particular, the, the like, yeah, as much as he's getting older, as as uh, as I think both of you noted in your pieces, Alexi did benefit from having this extra time, just being able to recover from his previous injury. But the thing about about his shoulder, like he got through again, like an extremely long competition without showing any evidence of of having diminished strength or feeling like he was having to take his foot off the gas. It was, you know, it may have been a close victory, but it didn't look like we were seeing only a shadow or or that he was like, you know, the wheels were coming off the wagon towards the end of it for him so uh it, it felt solid and believable um uh my headline kind of relates into this and and it's the part where uh we talk about the format itself and my headline from this which always comes as a surprise to me because i'm stupid and very biased but this format glues you to your screen when you get onto the finals day and as much as all of us want separate disciplines for the olympics and and it will be better for the climbers and and for us when it gets there there like it it is extraordinarily exciting when you get down to it you can't you i mean we talk about like a, a dual what do they call it like a dual screen uh kind of lifestyle where you just got the tv and then your phone where at speed at uh, combined climbing, it's it's your your screen and then your calculator in the other hand, and you're just like, 
banging through the numbers towards the end, trying to figure out every permutation of stuff. And as much as I don't like a lot of that, which I'll talk about in a second, I, I can't get over how invested I was, even though none of the competitors were Canadian. Um, and even though for my favorites, it didn't quite pan out for them. Um, I'm curious if you guys have thoughts just on the, on the format and its effect. Yeah, I think, yeah, I was glued to the screen as well. I was actually tethering the entire event off my phone, which I think shows some level of commitment <laughs> at least. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, from the athlete's perspective, I really don't know how they do it. It's just the skin that they lose and how fatigued they must be. I was just emotionally <laughs> fatigued right after the event finished, really, just from watching. Um I'm not a fan of the format for the climbers, but I agree that it's really riveting to watch it. Um, as Charlie Bosco used to say, like it really isn't over till it's over. And I think a lot of people who are maybe new to the format would have thought, oh, Sasha's got it in the bag or um, Sasha's got it in the bag. But then mm -hmm. there was still just one climber to come after each of them. Yeah, and I, I was totally that guy. I was that guy. Tables. Yeah, I was yeah. too. Like, I think, no, it's not intuitive <laughs> for anyone at the moment. Like, we've not had that many combined competitions. And it's still, like, even for the athletes, even for coaches, just trying to figure out what will happen. There's just so much suspense and hanging on until the last climber has fallen off or topped out. And looking at the clock to see what time they topped out in, there's just so mm -hmm. many uncertainties. Yeah. I loved it too. I I I don't know if it was that I was that we're so starved for elite level competition climbing, or if it's just it was this this happened over the Thanksgiving holiday here in the states. So there, it's kind of like accepted that you're just going to be lazy and like watch TV or watch something, you know. So I, but I just I love this competition. I had the best time watching it. I also was glued to the screen for, uh, you know, every every round and and every discipline. I too. I agree with both of you. I agree, Natalie, that if I was a competitor, I don't think I would I would like this format. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, of course, if you're an, if you're a bouldering specialist or a lead specialist, and then somebody tells you you're going to have to learn how to be proficient at speed climbing, that, you know, that would not be fun. But as of as a viewer, when it comes down to the wire, it's so thrilling. And I think one of the things that really makes it that way is this multiplied scoring because. <laughs> It, that is so unforgiving. I mean, if you think about <clears throat> the difference between getting first and getting second, which like second just like doubles your score, right? So it's like that's that's such a that's such a uh, just an unforgiving um, way to do the scoring because you're and I'll get into this later when we talk about some of the specific competitors, but your score can so quickly balloon from something that's pretty good to something that's in the hundreds or in the thousands or something like that. So um, so I think the multiplied scoring is part of what makes it really exciting for me. I, I want to bring up a point on that because it, it bothered me a little bit. And it is a hypothetical, but I don't really trust organized sport or the Olympics to not be above occasional corruption when it comes to certain things. So the, the hypothetical that really stood out to me this weekend was, uh, and I screw it. Spoilers. It's been three days. So if you haven't watched it, you get wrecked. Um, but at the end of the men's uh, combined final, so we're on the lead route. And at this point uh, in uh, I'm trying to remember who is in. Well, I get we'll leave it at this. Sasha Lehman finishes his climb, does it faster, uh, manages to get the first place spot in the lead portion. And that puts him in the lead right now with only what one more climber to come out. Um, so everything looked really good. And the, the problem I have was that the next climber to come out, uh, uh, Yuval Shemla, uh, from Israel, who also a breakout weekend for him, frankly, mm -hmm. it, he was at a position where he was not in contention for a medal anymore or let alone the win. Right. So there's really no incentive for him to do his best aside from his, you know, personal drive to try and top the route. And what, frightened me was if you change Yuval and put him on the Russian team all of a sudden, if he were a compatriot of of Alexei, who had the most to gain from him not performing his uh, uh, his best or, or sorry, I should I should uh, switch that around uh, if he was on the Swiss team. If a Swiss climber comes out in that situation and for, with any signal from the coach suggests, hey, 
there's nothing you can gain from topping this route. So consider just slowing down a little bit or consider not trying your best and your teammate will get the gold medal or go to the Olympics in this case. There becomes this possibility for a conflict of interest where you don't have to do your best and great things can come to you within a very small circle of collusion. And that made me a little bit worried. And it's something that we won't have to deal with just for for this year, but also if we still stay with even a portion of combined in this in this format. So let's say we go to 2024, speed has its own metal set, but we still have bouldering and lead combined. If they use that same multiplier system, you could run into that same risk of, you know, John, you and I are on the, on, on the team, you're in first place place but if i do this certain thing i can guarantee that for you um that made me a little bit nervous and i know that the, the the meme right now is like drinks are on alexi uh for the rest of forever for for yuval in fact for the entire israeli team um but uh it, that that one little thing stood out as oh there is this really big window for the possibility of like foul play um, and I hope that's something we keep an eye on, not from uh, not in the window of like accusing climbers when they don't do well. I really don't want people to do that, but it's something we have to be extra conscious of um, because we did open up this possibility for that. And we know that there is a lot of money in being an Olympic gold medalist and some places are willing to pay for that. Um, I know that Russia is dealing with their own thing after that doping scandal. I'm not trying to pile on to this like idea that Russia is a bunch of corrupt sportsmen. I don't believe that's true in climbing. But it's something just to be aware of. And that made me a little bit nervous towards the end. So that's my one point I wanted to to bring up. But yeah. And, and you know, that Tyler, I don't even know uh, that, that would get into some weird gray area of is that even wrong? I mean, it's weird. It'd be weird. It'd be kind of unfortunate. It'd certainly be unfortunate if you were one of the athletes that, you know, was told to, like, not do your best, essentially. But uh, but the big thing that we keep saying in. Uh, is like well at this level it's a team sport right there's your national team your your country team and so in that sense if that is true if you take that to the extent that you would you would sacrifice kind of your own performance for the betterment of someone else on your team um uh, you know i don't know you you could make an argument but that, that would, that's just that would really team... be the first time though in your like team relationship that you've ever actively taken actions to help a teammate win right aside from maybe like yeah. giving them a power spot in practice or some shit like that like your competitors think that's that's right. you train together and there's a sense of patriotism as coming from the same country but you are competitors i do get your point though and it's something that i think i, I hear about in in racing where you know you'll have teammates from the same like car manufacturer or whatever and and sometimes there will be a call made to basically say, hey, slow down a little bit and you're going to get your teammate across the line. Um, but it, it's, you know, that's a really good point to find out whether or not it is something that's technically um, against a certain rule set. But it is like, just imagine, you know, imagine you're the, the subject of that kind of situation that, that it doesn't put it in a good light. And I think I think it is worth taking a, a harder look into. I should do that just to find out if it I because I kind of assumed it would break some sort of rule just having. I guess in my hypothetical, it involves communication between the coach and an athlete when they're technically mm -hmm. isolated from each other. So that by itself would be an issue. But it, that is a good point. It may not mm -hmm. even be a, like you can't really accuse somebody of not trying their best. Right. It's pretty hard to prove that kind of thing. So you have to prove that there was some kind of communication or um, I don't even know what the, the the word for it is right now, but some not blackmail, but some some certain amount of collusion or pre uh, uh, um, you know coordinated effort to uh, to to change the results, um, and that I, I worry a little bit about that. But it's a good point; we should look that up. I think it's also it's sometimes hard to know exactly how, what the athletes know backstage mm -hmm. because they're aware of the results, like the rankings between each round. And also, if they can hear that people are topping out, um, you know, it's obvious to me that a lot of the climbers knew that they just had to race up that wall to top the route. They knew it was easy and they knew that if they got the fastest time, they'd be in first place and they could probably work out the repercussions of that in their head. Um, so sometimes I don't think you even need collusion with coaches, you know, just communication with coaches. Um, the athletes have got quite a good idea in their heads of what they need to do and what will happen if they do that i think yeah that's a fair point and i, I don't want to continue too much in the weeds with this but that brings up another point that i'm not even so sure that it's a, a good rule that 
coaches cannot communicate with the athletes during the during the attempts. I like if you look at other other sports, football, baseball, whatever, like the coach is sitting there calling plays, telling the quarterback the plays. That would just add another element to the sport. If the coach was actually broad, if the coach and the athlete could actually communicate uh, during the, the attempts. Now, of course, it would be kind of easier during something like bouldering where there's maybe some downtime in between the attempts rather than the, the lead climb. I'm not advocating like a the, the climber wears an earpiece or something like that to listen to the coach. But but it just brings up another another question of, well, why can't why shouldn't coaches be able to communicate with their climbers during um during the the competition well the like the big argument is the sequential nature of it so if you come out second your coach has all of this hindsight that the coach from the previous athlete didn't have so i th I think that's an odd starter although i love thinking about that every once in a while like what kind of dumb muscle climbers could we have if their coach is just like no your foot has to go over there um, i think that'd be super funny you just like have just like incredibly strong body aware climbers that just can't read ba maybe that's not even a thing maybe that climber wouldn't even exist but that that could be really interesting a beta sprayer yeah exactly. employ, like national beta beta yeah. sprayers for yeah, each yeah. team yeah all of the paraclimbing uh uh um hearing deficient coaches with their with their cones and stuff they would suddenly have way more job opportunities because they know how to give like perfect calls to uh yeah, uh, yeah not hearing uh, uh uh visual deficiency i guess yeah. if they're doing the calls my bad all right let's let's talk about uh, although we kind of covered some of them let's talk about the biggest winners from this event um john i'll let you go first with this one who's your who who really walked away looking the best from uh from this weekend yeah, well, I so I have a list of winners. I don't know if I'll ra maybe instead of like rattling off all Only of them, I'll one just give, like, can one win. At a time. Only one um, can win. No, I mean I'll give one at a time, and we can kind of discuss it. No, um, only one. <laughs> the, you know, I I don't know. I won't put these in any specific, not in any specific order. I don't know if I can say this is the biggest winner, but since we haven't talked about it yet, um, I just wrote down speed climbing at the Olympics is is the big winner because. Um, with the new world record that that was set by Yulia Kaplina and, and Tyler, I know you have some interesting thoughts about about that and kind of how that helps kind of contextualize her her whole career and frame her whole career in a new light. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, there's a video on this channel you can take a look at. Yeah, and but I mean, you have to hope, don't you, that uh, Ari Sisanti Raheyu gets maybe that Asian continental championship spot, right? Um, because think about how great speed climbing at the Olympics would be if you had Yulia Kaplina, who is already qualified, if you had Yiling Song, who is already qualified, if you had, um, who else, Anik Jobert, if you had uh, Alexander Miroslaw, right? If you had just kind of the top of the top of all these speed climbers who have either held the world record or kind of hovered around the world record, if you had them all competing, um, at the Olympics, that is pretty darn exciting. And we have seen in, in kind of in practice now how getting first in a speed, in the speed portion of the combined can really make a huge difference for an athlete. Um, it, it, if, if a speed climber can win the speed discipline, the speed portion, they are still very much in the running for the, for winning that, the, the gold for the combined. And so new world record, it wouldn't be outlandish to think that the record might get broken at the Olympics since we've seen that women's world record get broken a number of times over the past year or two years. Um, so I just think that speed climbing at the Olympics, I have so much hype and anticipation for that right now. Um, it'd just be great if Aries is in there too. It, you know, it would only seem right. I, I've, I've thought a little bit about that. And the question I, I come to is, let's say you stack like right now there's what four women who are speed specialists you have yulia kaplina alexandra miroslav yiling song uh anik Jobert got the tripartite thing maybe i'm missing one but the thing i keep thinking about is only one of them can come away with first in the speed climbing discipline and the rest like all of them are going to get wrecked in the other two because especially with the female speed specialists they are really speed specialists whereas the men qualified there are a couple that kind of uh, can kind of hold their own in bouldering Rishat being one uh, Mikhail Mawam being another but it almost weakens the field for the people like 
Yanya and Shauna, those more those generalists, it basically says, oh yeah, there's let's say four or five speed climbers in the comp. Really, only one of them is going to get through. So you're you, the number of people you're really competing against is actually much smaller, and it dilutes the chance of people getting those really like a uh, uh, low ranks in um, in the speed climbing qualifier. So I I. Part of me would really like speed climbing to look incredible at the Olympics and have like the, the semifinals and the big and small final at the Olympics be like banger races, like world record after world record after world record would be so sick. But I can't help but think only one speed specialist can actually get to the final. It's not going to be two. So I, I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit conflicted about that, but it, it, it could be really interesting. I also thought speed Sean at this event, getting a world record, but also like the injury from Alexander Miroslav, which was devastating, but a very intriguing moment. Like I rewatched that a couple times. Um, uh, and then of course, falls, false starts. Like it was a jam packed, uh, speed event at the, at the beginning, sorry, like the European speed championship, not the combined portion of it. Um, but it, it did come away looking really good. I had a great time and uh, it's, it is fascinating how fast the female world record falls compared to the men's world record. That's something that if you're a speed specialist watching and you might have some insight to that, you should do some content around it. Cause it's been like over three years now since we've seen the men's record change, whereas the women's has changed like four times since then. So a really interesting difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought from my perspective, the winner, Obviously, aside from Victoria and Alexei, um, Aliska Adamovska really stood out. She's only 19, um, and in lead especially, she was really composed, cool, calm and collected. She topped out on almost every route that she was given. Did she top out on every route? Pretty much, I think. Yeah, she um, might have. I, I, It's kind of a blur, but um, yeah. it certainly came... She, if she did not, it was certainly close. She just looked like another level um, in lead, really. And in bouldering, she could hold, hold her own as well. Um, she was one of the three that topped all the problems in the boulder qualifier, I think. And she just looked really talented. Um, and I'd never really heard of her before. Obviously, when we think of Czech climbers, we think of Martin Stranek, Adam Ondra. Um, but we haven't really seen many female Czech climbers rise through the ranks. And yeah, she just looked really good and I'm excited to hear more from her. Um, as you said, you can't really compare her without seeing all the climbers who would normally have been at the competition, who do the World Cup circuits, but she certainly looked promising. She was just so dominant and lead. She's another one of those climbers that has lifetime drinking privileges from the Russians after yes. like being being that yeah. one last opportunity for Stasha to uh, <laughs> to go through. So yeah. yeah, somebody else who's exerted their uh, their influence this weekend. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was really impressed by her, and it, it was kind of again somebody that uh, it felt like a bit of a coming out party uh, for mm -hmm. her, just because you know, especially for for me where I really don't pay attention to Europeans that uh, that that don't make finals or only occasionally show up at World Cup semifinals. Uh, it was it was somebody that. That is now, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to forget her. She's she's on my radar and uh, and hopefully uh, it's a, a colorful future for her. I'm trying to figure out what my uh, what my winner is going to be. But I think I had a couple I was going to choose from, but I'm 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 going to choose this one. I the after what you guys have said, I think that the next biggest winner is actually Matt Groom, who took over the commentary uh, this weekend. And I can't really imagine a more difficult event to go into as an English commentator, but then to have so many things go right for him in a way like it must have been a bit of aside from it just being probably very difficult on his voice for that many days. But he comes into it kind of last minute. You have all of this pressure from people that were fans of the previous guy and you have to to prove yourself and we all know he's talented but you still have to prove yourself and and get people on board but then you have to deal with pronouncing all these names and of course I, i'm not sure if it was a joke or not but he suggested he might be a little bit dyslexic which makes it brutal to go through the you know seven syllable slavic names is is really tough um, and then th the one thing i was curious about your opinions for and i wanted to ask him this but i didn't get a chance to was at first, I was thinking, man, having the live chat, which is very unusual for an IFSC comp, was probably 
a blessing for him having a foil to to respond to and and being able to engage because he is somebody that is really great at being charismatic and and uh communicating with other people um he he kind of started to play off of some of the jokes and some of the comments and brought the some of the culture i, I culture might not be the, the word that a lot of people expect but you know the the jokes we make about athletes the 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 memes that come out of out of a live chat are are really things that can make people remember certain athletes and remember stories so like the idea of of like hannes shampooman just for having incredible <laughs> looking hair or you know whatever it is Having all that for his first time out when he's sitting in the booth alone in a lot of cases, I thought that he couldn't have gotten a bigger blessing from the event gods to like ease him into it, give him something to talk about. The flip side of that was you also had people that were just like spamming that he was pronouncing things incorrectly. And of course, we have to get geopolitics involved in everything. Um, but uh, I was curious about your thoughts on on Matt, of course, and, and maybe Charlie's depart departure. But if you thought the, the live stream was maybe a, a benefit for this event or not, because we talk about it all the time about whether or not it should be there. I like having it, but it's uh, it it this weekend certainly proved the the pluses and the minuses of having uh, the the chat. Yeah, I think Matt did a stellar job. Like there was so much pressure on him, like such big boots to fill after Charlie's leaving, and you know Charlie's big announcement on Instagram. Then it's like oh, Olympic qualifier event combined over ten days everyone's watching because they're all in lockdown and nobody can spectate um yeah i think when he started the live stream he said something like oh i'm feeling a little bit lonely here because he was on his own which is a really tough gig uh, for most of the event and i think he just really worked that live chat feature and got people talking got people really engaged um i think a really cool thing about that is that it engages a younger audience. Um, YouTube, you're older. And I'm not going to try and define what old is. We've already kind of talked about that, but <laughs> maybe like 30 or 40 people, they don't tend to you know, be involved in that YouTube climbing culture as much. But he got kind of Instagram, YouTube, probably TikTok users <laughs> um, engaging with competition climbing in a way that hasn't really been done before I don't think and it brought Matt's sense of humor out it got people talking about funny things that were happening it was like such a high pressure event but at times I felt like it was quite enjoyable I'm sure it was different for the the athletes themselves but um he made it such an enjoyable easy watch for mo for the most part over what should have been quite a laborious a slog of like hours and hours of broadcasting i don't know how many hours he did because mm. normally you don't broadcast qualifiers yeah typically mm -hmm. but you had to just do everything right from the off and yeah he just held it together really well i think i thought he did a great job too i i actually tyler you kind of combined i had in my winners column i had the youtube i had youtubers because of the live chat and i had matt groom i thought um i thought that the, it was it was great having the live chat. It's something that you and I have talked about in the past, Tyler. That it's such an easy thing to in, for the IFSC to include that kind of spurs this the community and the conversation. It was really cool too that some competitors like Magnus Mitbo and or former competitors, you know, like actually hopped on there too. Like what other what other sports can you actually just like dialogue with the the big names from the you know from the past and present? So that was. That was really, really great, maybe aided by the fact that a lot of the competitors, when they weren't competing since the COVID stuff, they were just kind of cooped up in their hotel or whatever, so they hopped on too, but that was that was really great. Matt did a wonderful job. I think the best thing that he did is he didn't try to be Charlie, right? Like, he was very clearly his own his own voice. He, he His sense of humor was a little different. He brought in the live chat more than, than Charlie did, obviously, because it wasn't there for a lot of times that Charlie was, was broadcasting. Um but, Tyler, to your point, I think it's definitely worth just kind of mentioning a little bit about Charlie's departure, because as great as Matt was, we're all in agreement. Uh, it was also just it's it's really sad to see uh, to see a, a competition, an IFSC level, high level competition without Charlie. And, um, you know, Charlie has brought he's he's brought a voice to so many big moments of the past couple years he's he's really his 
announcing, in my opinion, is really inseparable from the moments themselves. Like when I think back to if we had to make a list of what were some of the biggest moments of the past couple of years, stuff like, you know, Yanya's run in, in the bouldering and lead World Cup and the rise of Che Un So. And then years ago, it was like Jian Kim just winning like lead after lead after lead. When I think about those moments, I think about not just the action, but about Charlie's voice um, uh, celebrating them and announcing them. And I think that that's the mark of a truly great uh, commentator, which, which is that you, you they become synonymous with the action itself. And, and, and like I said, inseparable. And um, Charlie... He, he's rightly so going to go down in history as a key figure in the IFSC's growth and popularity over these last couple of years. Certainly this historic time of the Olympics inclusion, uh, Charlie has been the voice for that. And um, it's just been it was a real joy listening to his calls for the past few years. So um, it's sad to see him go. He's a great, a, a phenomenal commentator as far as I'm concerned for for comp climbing. Yeah, I, I don't want to make it sound like he died because I feel like a right. lot of the reaction was like, yeah, we've, not, we've and, and, lost a giant. <laughs> but... yeah, and he said, he said he's going to still be, I mean, he's still going to be around. He's going to be around the comp scene. He admitted that. So it's like it's he stepped away from competition cl from the IFSC. Uh, he didn't step away from <laughs> he's not going into hibernation or mm -hmm. something. Right. So, yeah. yeah, we should preface all these all these. But. But my point still stands. Yeah, I think he, I think he held a really interesting position, mostly because his his tenor behind the desk was kind of synonymous with uh, the promise of a new of a new climbing scene. It was like he shows up shortly after we're announced in the Olympics, and over the the five ish like really four and a half years that he was commentating, climbing was just like edging towards something greater. And so he got to kind of be the voice of this really optimistic period of climbing. Um, for Matt, it could be even better than that. You know, he starts off with, with if, if Matt continues to do this, I, I honestly don't know if he's going to uh, just start doing the world cup seasons or whatever, or, or let alone the Olympics. I think he'd be great if he does. Um, but you know, he's going to start with a bang, but what comes next is, is really up in the air. Um, we, don't have that huge goal to fight for anymore. We've kind of made it in a way. Uh, and of course, we, we don't know what the Olympics is going to do to the sport. We don't know if it's going to be a bit of a boom and then a bust or if it will just keep chugging along and growing and growing. So I think Charlie had a really important era in, in climbing. And, and you're right, his voice is going to be, be stuck with that for a long time. And I'm very curious to see what the next era happens to hold for whoever comes next. Um, let's talk about, does Natalie, do you, do you want to say anything? Cause you kind of know Charlie yeah. better than all, better than, better than both Tyler and I. So, um... yeah, the, obviously, well, I used to watch Charlie when he was doing his Epic TV stuff. Um, and the first time I met him was actually at the world cup in Briançon. must've been 2014 or 2015. Um, he actually messaged me, he bumped into me and he was like, Oh, um, do you want to come and commentate with me later? Because I wasn't competing because I'd injured my finger a few weeks before. Um, so I was just kicking around. He was like, oh, do you want to commentate with me? And I was really nervous. And it was one of his first competitions. I think it was maybe, yeah, middle of the year, probably only done a couple of competitions. Um, but he was really friendly. And, yeah, we've worked, since then we've worked together on UKC things. And he used to write up post-competition competition like reports and stuff um which i'll miss them for because <laughs> they do take quite a lot of time you have to um, do them now i guess right yeah <laughs> but his voice definitely gets in your head like once you've spent hours and hours listening to his broadcasting and then editing his reports <laughs> um he's definitely synonymous with particular moments in ifsc history like yanya's uh, sweep in Vail. Like I was actually competing in Vail at the time, so I missed it on the live stream. But I made a point of going back and listening to find out what he said and how he called it. And yeah, it was really memorable. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think he'll go on to do good things. And yeah, he'll stick about. I'm sure he'll get a lot of dark pleasure knowing that his voice is just like living inside our heads for uh, <laughs> forever. He'll enjoy that. I'm sure. Uh, let's talk about the biggest losers from. Uh, oh, I I had one more winner that I wanted oh, to mention. How many winners can we? <laughs> We're all winners. 
<laughs> yeah, John, John's the participation <laughs> ribbon of this podcast. <laughs> I, put, I put Stasha Gejo on on my winners list, um, and now I. Of course, she it's heartbreaking. She didn't get that Olympic berth that we know that she's she's been very vocal about. That was a dream of hers. So, of course, you could put her on the the list of losers because it's so sad. Like she missed out on that. It's it's really heartbreaking. But I put her on my winners list because she she had that really debilitating knee injury um, for the longest time. And. I think I look at this competition as kind of her statement that she's fully back and really better than ever. I mean, she just like she she almost got an Olympic berth after a, a knee injury that that could have, you know, just like ruined her career, um, quite frankly. Um, so the fact that she came back and looked uh, so consistently good on that knee that 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 had been so troublesome for her for so long, um, I just think that that was a really bright takeaway probably not much of a consolation for for her compared to an olympic berth like i said that's just unfortunate she gets third in the bouldering discipline and then and then second in the combined discipline which is as we know second in combined is like the most heartbreaking place of all right because you you just just barely missed out on that on that ticket but uh but i put her on my my winner's list because she looked so good and seems to be better than ever well, first on my list of losers is Stasha getting. No. <laughs> no, I, I, I'll go first with this one. Um, no, Sasha Lehman is unfortunately the the biggest loser from this event, and it's not something we necessarily built up to. Like, I don't think he was the guy that everybody listed as like the definitive favorite from the event, but if only from the like what was it two minutes and ten seconds that he had, where he went from the purest ecstasy I'm sure he's ever had in his athletic career with the Swiss judges or the Swiss uh, um, coaches just like raging in the stands, kind of suggesting that he's got this, which I absolutely bought into as well. I was like, it's over. Like he won this thing. And then this guy who I've never really watched before, Yuval Shemla of Israel, the climbing powerhouse of Israel comes out and speed runs this lead climb. It, it was a stunning reversal of of fortune in in literally like two minutes and twenty seconds. Um, so if only for him having to live through that really awful roller coaster of emotions, I have to say he's the one that probably uh, came out of this feeling worse than anybody. Um, although Stasha did a great job of trying to convince us that she was furious, um, she was very emotive. I think uh, I think Sasha's uh, situation probably hurt the most of anyone's. I think for me, Yane Kruda. Um, I know the Slovenian team were really in two minds about sending athletes. Like obviously, a cancellation of the event would have had major consequences for Yane. He would have been, he would have earned an Olympic ticket had the event been cancelled. So I, I didn't beat about the bush with that. He said, you know, it would benefit me if this event was cancelled. We, we're not sure whether we want to go. We don't think it's safe. Um, but ultimately, they did attend the event. And I don't know. I kind of feel like the pressure might have got to Yane a bit. I remember Matt Groom interviewing him. He was saying, oh, so it's a small matter of the Olympic ticket at the end of the week. Are you thinking much about that? And he was like, oh, no, I'm just taking it a day at a time, one climb at a time. But I think ultimately, in that boulder qualification round I think it was too easy and because it was easy and he had to flash well had to at least top all of the problems and flash them if he could I think it just got to his head in his strongest discipline um, and he just fell apart and it was so sad because I think a lot of people would have put their money on Yane to take that ticket um, not knowing how strong the Russian team would come out and he just kind of fluffed it a bit yeah <laughs> it's too bad too because you as we know like the olympics is entertainment as much as it's it is sport and you is a, a charismatic personality in the in the comp scene he's a fan favorite he's he's a lot of people that kind of wa watch are, are familiar with him are fans of his it would have of course added something to have him in the olympics in that sense um yeah, that's it's just a it's unfortunate. Um, 
I agree with your pick there, Natalie. I agree, Tyler, too. Sasha Lehman, this is going back to what I was saying with that multiplied score. That So Alexei finishes with 20 to win. Um, I think Sasha's score in the combined was like 24. Mm-hmm. So he missed out by four points. And if you think about, again, like I said at the top of this this broadcast here, as as quickly as these multiplied scores can balloon into the hundreds and into the thousands, to be just separated by only four points, it's like it does not get any closer than that for the combined discipline, um, which just it, it, that's just really uh, unfortunate for Sasha. Yeah. And he really wore his emotion on his sleeve, of course. Um, I kind of felt bad because the, he was obviously crushed at the end of the combined and the camera kept going back showing him. And I was like, oh, just shoot. I wish we, he could just have some privacy, you know, because it was obviously a really crushing moment. Understandably, um, you couldn't help but feel for him. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a, a biggest loser aside from these two? I'm curious if you would uh, add somebody else to the list. Yeah, I you know, I. I put Petra Klingler on there for kind of a different reason. Um, the injury she, she had again, going from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. I think during this, if I wrote down, she set a new Swiss speed record of 8.59 during the, during the speed discipline. Um, and then she injures her shoulder and, and withdraws from the competition. Um, it's unfortunate for two reasons. First of all, she's already got that Olympic birth. So for, in terms of the Olympic push, she didn't actually like have to be there, right? Quote unquote. Um, she was just doing it, you know, presumably to stay in shape, to to make an appearance. It was great, and she, it's good having her there because she's she's a bit just like we were talking with Yerne. She's one of those big names, so it was nice in this field of a lot of relative unknowns. You had somebody like like Petra there, but with the injury, now. Now we have a situation where it's it's like the worst situation that nobody wants to see, which is an athlete qualifies for the Olympics and then gets injured. And the question is, like, I mean, you, you hope she can heal so she's able to compete uh, at the Olympics. She has obviously plenty of time, a lot of time to heal. Um, but the fact that she already has that Olympic birth and then she gets injured and is now in, in recovery leading into the Olympics uh, just – really unfortunate really sad and so that's why i put her on the on the list of of the losers that's a I good thought it was go ahead natalie sorry i thought it was really interesting how the two athletes who had to withdraw through injuries were two who were already qualified for that's right Miroslav, Alexander. Alexander. Yeah. yeah yeah good point that's an interesting angle because when i was first looking at it i was like oh you know it's not that bad they didn't like because i guess in my head i thought uh it would have been worse if they hadn't qualified yet because that would be really disappointing that they could no longer qualify but your angle of it's almost you know it's it's if they just hadn't shown up they would have been fine and been in a better position i didn't really think it through with that angle and and you're kind of right like they kind of got injured for maybe for nothing i guess i think i think the european championships depending on who you are means a lot to you but that's a really good angle that was kind of the opposite of what i would say about them so yeah that's a really interesting point and and it really brings up a question of how many of these athletes that have qualified are going to compete on the World Cup circuit? Uh, presuming we, we have a World Cup circuit next this summer because of COVID and everything um, leading into the Olympics. I mean, you know, Miroslaw and Petra are kind of two good case in points where that might be a risky proposition. Um, mm-hmm. And I know that athletes are probably balancing wanting to stay in shape, wanting to have that kind of competition practice with the fact of not wanting to get injured. Um if I was in their shoes, I would, it'd be a really tough decision. I think you could make a case for not doing any world cups, um, you know, leading into presuming their world cups prior to the Olympics, uh, maybe not doing any of them because it, it, it does risk at that level, at that intensity, it does risk getting injured. It seems almost like a, a harder and riskier decision now than it was given that because of COVID, you haven't had this season to happen. So you're coming back from an even longer time away. Um, and it just amplifies the stakes of everything. You you need that comp practice more than you ever have before. And at the same time, you are, are less 
possibly suited to to doing it um, than uh, than in the past. So I think it'll it'll be interesting to watch what decisions uh, teams make about those Olympic athletes. I imagine it's probably not just in the athletes' hands at this point. I imagine the decision making team is is larger than just themselves uh, now because of how much is riding on it, especially for those top tier competitors. But yeah, that'll be looking for the start lists of those first events will be very interesting. Um, mm-hmm. All right. The, the last question I wanted to, to to go off of, and I sent you guys a link just for reference, was we're getting very close to having uh, a full field of Olympians. Uh, we just still need two more from Asia, two more from Oceania, and two more from, honestly, South Africa. Um, the rest of the continent, unfortunately, will probably not be represented. Um, and I think the, the question I have for you guys is based on who is qualified already, if you had a new viewer come to you and say, oh, I didn't know the Olympics were, uh, uh, or I didn't know climbing was in the Olympics. What, what's, what's the story I should follow? Who, who should I be really keeping an eye on? Or like, why should I bother watching this? I'm curious based on the current field, what you think will be the most intriguing stories for, uh, for new viewers to follow? Um, and I will, I'm going to throw John under the bus first. Um, Talk through your, talk talk through your, uh, talk through your, uh, thinking process as you consider this. Okay. Well, um, I guess I would be curious. I would, I would want to know where the, in this hypothetical situation, I'd want to know where the person is from, because I think if they're from a country that has athletes that have qualified, um, for the Olympics, there's nothing better in the Olympics than just kind of that very natural sense of cheering for whoever is, has, has qualified from your home country. Right. And that's, what's great about having climbing in the Olympics is it, it puts the sport of climbing in that context um, where so many other Olympic sports are, which is like, for instance, I don't know, something like um, I'm trying to think of a a sport like uh, fencing or something, right? Like I don't know anything about fencing, but if I turn on the Olympics and I see that there's an American competing, uh, in my in my case, I'm like, yeah, all right, I'll cheer for the American, right? So um, it's finally people can do that with climbing. But beyond that, I would say to me, as much as we had a phenomenal weekend, again, this kind of goes back to my headline, as remarkable as Victoria Meshkova looked, as great as competitors have looked in the Pan Ams and everything, um, I still think all eyes have to be on Yanya Garnbrett um, to see – um, to see, frankly, what she can do at, at the Olympics. How how great can she can she be? Um, is it possible that she could she could win the lead discipline and le- and win the bouldering discipline? Uh, it, I'm going to be really curious to see that. She's proven at the highest level that she certainly is capable of doing that. Um, and and so I'm going to just um, I think that that is going to be one of the most intriguing storylines is just is just seeing how great Yanya can be. Um, and I would say to anybody who, who is not a fan of climbing, watch Yanya Garnbrit because she is one of the greatest, if not the greatest competition climber of all time. And, and you get to witness her in the prime of her career, basically. I think if I was introducing a non-climber to climbing, the obvious choice for me, especially in the men, just looking at the list, would be Adam Andra. Like, they've probably already heard of him. Like, he's not Alex Honnold, not quite Alex Honnold, but um, I think just seeing how Adam does in the Olympics will be really interesting. You know, he's lauded as being the world's best climber because he's climbed the hardest sport grades, he's done the Dawn Wall really quickly, um, but how will he compare in the Olympics, which, you know, everyone knows it's the biggest sporting stage in the world um but i'm not convinced that he'll win i think currently our predictions at ukc for adam is about third or fourth place because i really think tomoa narasaki or someone like jakob schubert would especially given the fact that it's in japan i think tomoa might feel some pressure um I feel like, yeah, maybe maybe Jakob would be the one to pull it out of the bag, but I think Adam Andra is the one that will draw the most interest from climbers and non-climbers, purely because they want to see how he compares and how he 
competes in the Olympics. Um, we know he doesn't like speed climbing, but he's done it and he's got through. He had a bit of a nightmare trying to get his ticket, um, but when he got it, um, I think he'll be one of the people to watch. In the women's, Yanya, of course, like there's so much hype around her. And I think, again, she'll she'll have a lot of pressure to perform. And it's interesting that in a lot of the World Cups where the pressure's been really on her, she hasn't always performed that well, especially in lead. Um, if she gets flustered, she can sometimes lose it a bit. Um, it'd be really nice, I think, for me in the women's, Ekio Noguchi, she's, one of, she's the oldest woman at 31, 32. Um, for her to do really well and maybe not win, but at least get a podium, get a medal, an Olympic medal on her home turf in Tokyo would just be amazing. It's her last chance to compete at the Olympics. She was going to retire after 2020 and she's had to put back her career a whole year. Um, I think if she can do well, that would be a really great story. I think I, I'm going to agree with you on the Adam Andra one. And I, I think my argument for him is that, you know, first of all, you're right. Success is a bit of an uncertainty given that, you know, he's historically, he'll do one year of competitions, one year of outside, mm -hmm. one year of competitions. And we definitely remember the wins. Uh, but with Andra, we also remember the losses because he is by far the most emotive male climber. And so I think if you were trying to get somebody interested in what, like if you try and get somebody watching through like an entire qualification round or like a seven hour, you know, final event, I think the argument you make is you go on YouTube and you show them silence. You show him La Dura Dura when he was younger. You show him those like those screaming super cuts and you, you show them like this guy is nuts. He is the probably the best climber uh, in history and he's going to let you know how he feels. And I, I think it's going to like he's hilarious to watch on a speed wall. So there's like the, the humor factor there because it's just limbs everywhere. And then after that, whether he crushes or not, there will be noise about it. And I think he's just the one that you, uh, he's the most interesting one to watch. Yanya is a superstar as well, but she does not show or express how she's feeling and how she's doing in the same way he does. So if you're just trying to captivate somebody, I think Andra is the the obvious answer. Um, so yeah, I think uh, Team Andra, that's, that's the story to go with. And you know, what's interesting about Andra too, is that he is, uh, if you're, if you're putting, you know, if you're, if you're betting, he is probably going to get, you know, God bless him. He's probably going to get like last or close to last in speed um, unless he has essentially the run of his life. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas if you look at these other people like Tomoa, um, even Yanya, like Tomoa, you know, who knows? Sky's the limit. But Yanya, like maybe mid mid level would be good, would be a good prediction for her in speed. Um, but it's pretty much. I mean, I think it's pretty much guaranteed that Andre is going to be in a pretty big hole after the after the first portion, after the speed portion. And he's going to be um, having to fight his way out of that, which he has done before. Um, so he certainly can do it again. But I agree, I agree with what both of you said. He's he's captivating to watch, um, but he's going to be in a little bit of a compared to the other favorites, quote unquote, he's going to be in a little different situation because he does tend to struggle on speed um a little more than maybe the others do um so so yeah he'll be i think he'll be kind of struggling upward after the speed portion yeah i think uh, i think that that's uh, uh fair to say so he'll be he'll be the one to to watch just in terms of uh what'll keep you entertained regardless um i'll i'll open you guys up if you have any final thoughts um, feel free. We'll keep it short. But if there's anything we just haven't addressed, I know John's got a list right now. He's got a laundry <laughs> list of points beside him. <laughs> We're going back um, to the headlines. Here are my four other headlines from this event that I want. Well, to I you know I don't want to I don't want to dwell on the on the more losers too much. We didn't really mention how some of the route setting was a little disappointing with all the tops or in in other rounds like no t you know, no tops on other boulders. Um, but we'll like focus on the. I guess we'll focus, we'll end on the positive. Um, another winner that we didn't get to talk about was just the production of this whole thing. I thought that um, it's worth mentioning because we do we do mention when it when they don't do well, when there's glitches, when there's blackouts uh, um, on the on the broadcast. So I think it's also worth noting when that when they do it really well. 
Um, the the there was on screen scoring for the lead, which which is a big thing. That's always great when they have that um, in real time. There was some good diversity of of camera angles. There were kind of some weird cuts every now and then, frustrating cuts. Um, but um, but for the most part, I thought the camera work was good. Um, and and so I just I just thought they did a great job with the uh, with with the whole filming and the production of this. Yeah, I think also to go back to Matt Broom, he was also being broadcast on numerous TV channels like BBC Sports. So that all added to the pressure for him and he handled it really well. I think for me, another winner that I kind of wanted to mention earlier was Team Israel because they were just so enthusiastic and just gave absolutely everything to the wall. They were power screaming. They were really supportive of each other. Um, Yuval Shemla standout performance but also just as a whole I've noticed the last couple of years the Israeli team has some really strong female climbers I don't know if it's like the Alex Kazanov effect just kind of geeing up the whole team and the standards are just rising but they were so entertaining to watch and the sportsmanship was great and they just seemed to be having a really fun time as well as battling for Olympic places. Yeah, they were great on the stream as well. Um, I know a few of them did some commentary and they were they were excellent uh, co-commentators while they did it. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything you guys said, the production, the Israeli team. Uh, about the route setting, we'll, we'll call it a win as well. Um, Eddie made an excellent point. They There were a lot of rounds that were too easy. I completely agree with you. Uh, but the context Eddie brought, which I think is, is worth acknowledging, is that has there ever been a harder time to set a competition when you haven't gotten to see these people compete in ages? Some of these people, you may, as a top-level Russo, you may have not set for some of these people in the past, depending on, on where they're from. So the entire team, I think it was led by uh, Thomas Alexi and, and Jens Branick, like, talk about it like it's always a thankless job but this was pretty much as hard as it gets um so you know with with all that context that that uh, that eddie mentioned rightly i think was uh, uh pretty close to as good as you can get given the the situation so yeah cheers to uh all of them i think we should leave it there i appreciate both you guys talking um natalie berry editor-in-chief of uk climbing thanks for joining us and as always uh john bergman uh, you can find his write-ups at climbing magazine uh and of course make sure you buy his book for christmas there is an audio book right and then i'm sure there's an ebook as well there is yes yeah, it can all be delivered to your ipad in time for christmas if you don't want to buy you know a, a hard copy or whatever so so make sure you check out his book uh high drama rise fall and rebirth of american comp climbing uh, i'm tyler norton you can find me here at this youtube channel uh plastic weekly make sure you give a subscribe uh if you want to get plastic weekly stickers uh or get a shout out at the end of the video like the g5 thank you g5 for supporting us uh check out our patreon and if you want to talk about these costs as they're happening with me and some other friends or if you just want to talk about competitive climbing or gym culture in general join plastic weekly discord at the link below thank you again to both of you and we'll see you guys in the next one thanks for having me